before we start and I introduce um, Madeline to our wonderful uh, audience, uh, because uh, today you will have a great opportunity to see uh, the beauty of Ukrainian young generations. And uh, this project uh, means to strengthen their Euro-Atlantic identity, uh, not just to receive more knowledge about NATO, uh, NATO PA, but also, and also to have access to decision makers, uh, politicians, uh, NATO representatives, but also to learn more about uh, ex different experiences and actually how to build strong, resilience, uh, resilient Ukraine in the future. And um, our project is very important, especially uh, for next year, because next year we do believe that the historic parliamentary assembly of uh, NATO PA will take place, will be held in Kyiv. And uh, this is why for us it's crucially important to build a community of uh, young leaders uh, who will um, understand how the key democratic mechanisms of uh, NATO decision making uh, works? And uh, of course, we have we received uh, 215 applications from uh, students from key universities uh, from ma uh, major geographical regions of Ukraine, which is great. And we have students also from uh, uh, temporary occupied territories. And uh, I think we have to promote the values of NATO, especially for Eastern uh, Ukraine. And uh, in Kyiv, uh, in December, there will be a session of use model of NATO PA. And uh, the Speaker of Ukrainian Parliament, uh, Mr. Stefanchuk, confirmed his participation. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kuleba, Vice Prime Minister of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, also will join us. And it's really important through this project uh, to help uh, Ukrainian uh, youth uh, to better understand also Ukraine's commitments and uh, especially uh, reforms which are needed to meet NATO standards. Uh, and uh, I hope that this project will increase youth resilience to Russian disinformation and propaganda against NATO and all these anti-Western narratives, which like, like viruses are <laughs> spreading in different social networks. So uh, this is why um, through such uh, lectures, the, the students has, uh, have chances to ask different questions. Uh, and the most popular question uh, is about weaknesses of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so um, I hope also uh, today, uh, our students will uh, enjoy conversation with you as well-experienced member of UK Parliament. And also, uh, so I think we could actually start now. We have uh, 48 uh, students, but uh, more will be joining us. So uh, Oksana Yurinets is also with us, our leader of our project. Yes, the former yes, head yes. of uh, Ukrainian delegation to NATO PA. And so, dear, dear students, let me introduce Madeline Moon. Uh, I think uh, Madeline is a true friend of democracy and a true friend of Ukraine. Yes. Uh, and um, yeah, Madeline visited uh, Ukraine, not just mm -hmm. capital, Kyiv, but also uh, uh, Lviv and Yavorivsky Polygon. So, uh, um, by the way, in 2019, Madeline had a meeting with Ukrainian President Zelensky we when did. he just started his uh, uh, work as a president of Ukraine. And uh, I think uh, today you could also ask uh, Madeline uh, about uh, uh, parliamentary oversight uh, because uh, she has more than uh, or, or 15 years of experience serving as a member of UK Parliament. Yeah, and uh, Madeline, uh, it's for us, it's a big honor to have you, especially representing uh, UK, because just this weekend, uh, we read the news that British Special Forces ready to deploy 600 troops to Ukraine uh, amid Russia invasion fears. 
And uh, also this summer, uh, uh, we saw how Russians reacted on UK Ro Royal Navy defender in Black Sea. <laughs> so we could say that UK is a true defender of democracy. Uh, also UK is a true defender which demands from uh, authoritarian regimes to respect uh, rule of law and uh, to respect international recognized border. And uh, of course, uh, with, um, now we are like uh, every day just reading different news and uh, our colleagues from Latvia and Lithuania and Polish uh, parliaments, they made similar statements that the situation on the Belarus-Poland border is violated mm -hmm. and calls for concrete steps and commitment from the EU uh, Foreign Affairs Council. And it's also time to trigger Article 4 of NATO. There is a need for consultations with our allies on how to deal with this crisis, so-called crisis. And many comments like besides Article 4, it's uh, already time to use um, uh, Article 5 because this hybrid type of attacks we are a migrant crisis. It's also attack on the alliance, not just on Poland or uh, Lithuania and others. So I think um, so. Uh, today, uh, please share your experience within yes. NATO Parliamentary Assembly because I truly believe that one day um, some of our students will become a member of Parliament or Ministry of Foreign Affairs representing Ukraine. So I hope that the, your lecture will also uh, nice. provide for them uh, new knowledges and I think the most valuable your experience. So uh, dear students, uh, please uh, very carefully uh, listen and also prepare your questions uh, to Madeline because you have really unique opportunity uh, to listen one of the best experts in foreign policy with uh, practical experience, unique experience, and also representing UK, as I mentioned before, true defender of uh, democracy and true contributor to the regional uh, and global security. So yeah. Madeline, please, the floor is yours. And uh, yeah, the students is uh, ready. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me introduce you to a British expression. Flattery will get you everywhere. And you were very flattering in your introduction. Thank you. I, I hope I can live up to it. Oksana, lovely to see you again. It's always a pleasure. And I cannot tell you how much I miss you. So it's, it's good to be in an opportunity to spend some time. Now, I recognize some faces that have come up on the screen, faces I've seen before. And I want to start by saying how critical I think young people are to understanding what NATO is, what opportunities it brings to your country, but also what the threats are that we all face. Because many of the threats that we're facing in the new hybrid technology, you are perhaps better equipped to cope with than your parents and your grandparents. And the world that is going to emerge and the threats that will come with it are ones that you're going to be living with and following as they leave many of the older generations behind. So you have a critical role of vigilance and a critical role of sharing the understanding of what is happening and the subtle attempts to undermine 
your belief in yourself, your country, and the future in a world where democracy is something that you can aspire to live in and to help create. Sometimes there can be a feeling when you're young that people are talking down to you and are dismissing your understanding and desire to take part in some of the critical decisions in front of us. You have a unique opportunity because your generation will understand and recognize the threats in a new way, in a clearer, insightful way that perhaps older generations, because it's not technology that's been part of their daily experience, they struggle to maintain an understanding and a recognition of. When did I first become aware of Ukraine? Let me start from there. Uh, I had, uh, when I was a student, one of my uh, close friends in my friendship group was a, a young Ukrainian called Ola Maximuk. She was a very talented uh, artist and a distinct way of dressing that stood her apart from the rest of the students. And she would talk occasionally of the home that her family had been forced to flee from. And it left me with an indelible desire to understand. And I have to tell you, when I was 18, I had no concept that one day I would have the opportunity to travel to Ukraine. And I'm pretty sure that Ola never thought that her country would have the opportunities that you're facing now. So between us, we've been on a journey. Me, as someone whose family had no political aspirations. I didn't come from a rich family. I came from a family where I was the first generation to go to university. But I was born into a, war, a world where there was great concern about war, injustice, inequality, and the rights of women, and the opportunities for women. And life worked initially in education where my love of working with and communicating with young people really flourished. But I worked in some pretty poor areas of the UK where some of my, my students didn't have the opportunities to learn because of the poverty both uh, practical and emotional that they found at home. So I moved from teaching into social work where I felt I could help some of the students find some stability in their lives. And I worked in what was called child protection. So the children who were receiving physical and emotional abuse were the children that I specialised in working with. 
But again, I didn't feel I could make the changes to their lives that I wanted. So I moved again into politics because I felt, okay, in politics, I can make the rules. I don't just have to interpret the rules. I can start making the legislation. And there I discovered the importance of going back to the beginning and talking to people and helping people to see for themselves through education the changes that they can create in their own lives and the power that they can have to be part of those changes. So that's part of my message to you today. You are to be the change that you want to see. You have to take on that responsibility. And your journey might, like mine, take you to different places. But never forget whether you are in, you end up in business or in the public sector or in politics or in journalism, that as well as doing your job, you have a mission. And that mission is to tell people they don't have to be powerless, but they do have to take responsibility for the power that they can have. And that they have to share. Power is only worth having if you can share it and you can give it away. So I was very fortunate when I, I came to Ukraine. I met two people, apart from Oksana and her colleagues, my apologies. But I met two people that really impressed me. First of all, I met the mayor of Kiev. Uh, and Mr. Klitschko really impressed me. And he told me a story. Uh, excuse me, I have caught the, the great British cold. So I, uh, you might find me sniffling and coughing. Uh, he told me when he was a child, he was terrified of NATO. And that outside of the building where he lived, there was a giant statue. And I, I assume it's long gone now, but it showed a wolf's head with giant fangs, which were sort of dripping with blood. And this was a statue that embodied NATO. And that he thought that NATO was this terrible, terrible threat to Ukraine. And then he got a chance to travel. And because he was good at sport, he was sent to represent Ukraine in the United States. And when he was there, he saw something very different and came back and told people what he'd seen. And they said, that isn't what America is really like. They just built a town to fool you. And he realized he had to start changing his way of thinking. And that motivates his desire, he told me, to make Kiev a great city. And I have to say, I think it's a stunning city. And one of the problems when you come on a delegation is the most you ever see of where you're visiting is from the back of a bus and through the window of the bus. And you get very frustrated and you think, I've got to get back there and see it for myself. And then COVID comes along and I'm still waiting for that opportunity, but I will be coming. And then we had 
the opportunity for a 10 minute meeting with President Zelensky. And an hour later, we were still talking. And I had with me um, an official who was slipping a note across in front of me as I was talking to your president. And it said, we have to go, the plane leaves in half an hour and we have to get to the airport. Now, in politics, the more you interact with it, the more you see the importance of protocol. So the story that we heard at the start about uh, the French diplomat who took flowers uh, from Russian military was probably more about diplomacy. There are rules, very strict rules. So if you are a guest meeting a president, you don't end the meeting. You don't say, well, thanks very much. It's kind of you to meet me, I'm off now. That is just not done. And I was being told I had to do that. And it was, oh good, this is great. Thank you very much. And in fairness, the president was very gracious and said, don't worry about the plane, uh, but could you talk to the journalists before you leave? So we dashed to meet the journalists and um, we made the plane and we left. So I have very vivid memories of my time in Ukraine, but I was also in Ukraine to monitor elections. And that too is an important message for membership of NATO. Because people think, even here in the UK, and I have to tell you, you probably know more about NATO than people in the UK. Because here, we are very, very complacent, dangerously complacent. We have spent a thousand years working towards democracy. And we think we've got it sorted. And we haven't, because every day is a day working for democracy. There is no end point in a democracy. There are just threats to keep it alive. So NATO is not just about defense and soldiers and military and drones and jets and nuclear power. It's about what you're defending. It's about allies. It's about the people you share your values with and who you will stand alongside. Just as you and your personal lives, you know lots of people, but you know the difference between the people that you know and the people that you trust and the people that if they were in trouble, you'd stand by them. And they know that they can rely on you. And that is what NATO is. It is an alliance of like minded countries with the same values or people like the Ukrainian people on the road towards those values. My country had it easy. We had a thousand years to tackle corruption to tackle equality amongst its citizens, 
to tackle corruption, to tackle the idea of a, a media that was not controlled by the powerful for the powerful. And to make sure that we had a parliament that controlled the budget and the taxes and shared the taxes in a way that benefited all citizens rather than just the wealthy. And we're still working on that one, let me tell you. And where there was democratic oversight of our security services. We still haven't got it right. We are still working at it. And there are things that we're doing wrong, in my view. Things that I'm really not happy with and I'm quite concerned about. But you don't despair, you keep fighting and you keep pushing and you keep demanding and you keep educating and you keep raising the issues. Now, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. You are aspiring to be a member of NATO. But nor is Sweden. And Sweden is perhaps one of the most active members of NATO, who isn't a member. But Sweden sends personnel to more missions than some of the people who are members. So it's not just about membership, it's about participation and being willing to learn, to engage to take part. And most central in NATO is the issue of the rule of law. So NATO doesn't just decide, right, we're going to do this. It has to act lawfully. And the fact that the members come together to commit and decide, yes, we will together take this action. But it isn't compulsory for everyone, if, unless it's an Article 5. And we even have members such as Iceland who always send one person because their population is so small. So usually it's only one person who comes, but Iceland always turns up. Iceland doesn't have an army. It doesn't have an air force. It doesn't have a navy. It has a coast guard and it has an understanding of the oceans around Iceland, which are strategically important to the security of NATO. So it is a critical ally <laughs> because it brings critical information. And it is highly reliable as an ally. Sometimes we think of war as chaos. And in the past it was, and at the moment, because of the attacks in the gray zone and disinformation, it feels like that. But war is regulated by law. So there are laws of armed conflict. And part of NATO's responsibility is to hold countries like Russia, who signed up to the laws 
of armed conflict to remind them when they're breaking the law. There will always be countries like Belarus who is trying to break the rules and create tensions, create disharmony, and to justify at home, because you always have to remember the home audience is being played to, that what they are doing shows the weakness of the enemy, NATO, and the strength of Belarus and its leader. But people are not easily fooled. NATO's greatest weakness, and you were asking me at the beginning about weakness in NATO, is we like peace too much. So sometimes we are a little bit slow on the uptake. That's another British expression, slow on the uptake. We're, we're slow to recognize and to come together and to recognize and face the threats that are out there. And if you think we're being slow, you must yell, you must shout, you must you know, pound the table because we do sometimes take time to make critical decisions. The other thing that NATO offers you, even as candidate members, is experience. Experience through coming to meetings and seeing how other countries do things. It offers you Look, here are the rules, here you are. Take them away and rewrite them for yourself. We can show how to make things work and then you can make that work for Ukraine. So you don't have to start from scratch. That means you can save on many of the UK's thousand years of mistakes. And Boy, we've been great at making mistakes. Oh, amazing. But also, we will give you reports. The NATO Parliamentary Assembly writes amazing reports that analyze what is happening in the civil dimensions of security, in defense and security, in the economy, because the economy is critical to defense and defense is critical to defending your economy. Reports on science and technology and if Ukraine is the battleground of science and technology. As new technology is often tested out in Ukraine to see how can we get this information? How can we test out this ransomware attack? How can we push this disinformation campaign? So, as well as you being part of a country moving towards building its own democracy, at the same part, at the same time, you're playing a critical part in teaching the rest of NATO about survival, about resilience, about determination. And actually quite importantly, to people in the UK, in France, the old democracies about sheer guts of day by day by day, living with the threat of a powerful neighbor who would like to shut you up in your, and stop you on your road towards democracy. Because your road to democracy is the biggest threat that Russia faces. 
because no one is banging on the door to get into Russia. Nobody is saying, that's the life I want. I want to live in a country with no freedoms. I want to live in a country where oligarchs and the president and his allies steal most of the wealth. Nobody is saying, I want to live in a country that's fed lies and expected to believe them. In Britain, we like to quote Winston Churchill, a bit like Shakespeare. If Churchill hasn't said it, Winston, uh, William Shakespeare certainly did, but Churchill said, democracy is not the best form of government. It's just the best one we've invented so far. So thank you, because you're part of that democracy. You're part of securing democracy. And now I'm going to shut up and you can ask me what you'd like to know. Madeline, thanks a lot for, I could say both, um, very inspiring and also um, was um, your experience. So I have no more flattery, as you mentioned at the beginning. <laughs> so just tough questions from our students. Yes. Yeah, uh, and thanks for new idioms, slow on the uptake. So uh, this is something I also learned from you. And I probably agree with you that uh, you mentioned uh, complacent, uh, complacent, uh, complacency. Complacency, yes. So I think it's yes. really uh, important because um, during my conversation with some Canadian experts, and they also tell like, Hannah, we need you to tell our citizens because mm -hmm. they are lucky that Canada is a part of NATO. So it seems like for um, well-established, developed democracies, stable democracies, mm -hmm. they take it for granted. Yes. So uh, when we are paying price like human lives, uh, and uh, actually during the dignity revolution and now, so every day, and unfortunately, unfortunately during this weekend, we've lost soldiers. So it's a hot war going on eight years already. So this is why it's really important. So we have two participants raised hand. Plus we have questions to you, uh, both professional and uh, like not private, but personal. So uh, it uh, maybe will be the strange question, but Katya Malovana is asking, how is NATO planning react on increase of Russian army near Ukrainian border at this moment, except political support, whether they will be physical activities among them? So uh, first question, and uh, maybe uh, there are some other questions, but uh, still. It's hard, Nastya uh, Prashlyak, it's hard to work in place mostly dominated by men. Did you face a difficulty or prejudice based on being a woman? <laughs> so, and uh, personal questions, why you have chosen to work in NATO? So, uh, and, uh, so maybe we'll stop here because it's already three questions and then okay. there are written and also uh, questions I hope our seven participants already raised their hands, so they will ask. So, please. Okay. It's really interesting because um, I, I write a newsletter for members of parliament because one of the things I've discovered because I, I lost my, my seat, so I, I was no longer a member of parliament, at the last election. And I found that I've actually had time to read and to absorb information in a way that you never have as a member of parliament. Because you're, you always have 5,000 things to do in the time in which you will be lucky to get 100 done. So I write them a newsletter and I, I try to 
tell them what the thinking is at the moment. And Ukraine has figured highly in the thinking for them to look at this week. So uh, there's an excellent report uh, on the NATO website on Ukraine. Some of the American and UK think tanks have been issuing reports about Ukraine. Some are arguing that uh, this is about, again, distracting the internal populations of Russia and Belarus from the chaos of their governments. And it's, it is distraction for internal audiences rather than actual threat on Ukraine. Some are saying, yeah, well, we've seen that tried before, but we can't assume that if we believe it is just, uh, we call it saber rattling, then they're, they're making noises of war, but not going to do something, that they won't actually take action. So there is still a lot of discussion and debate But you are at the topic, and that is important because I would say that there was more media reports, academic reports, think tanks talking about Ukraine than anything else. You, you crowded Afghanistan out of the media. <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad in, in terms of how you see yourselves, but you have moved rapidly. And what is quite clear is no one's gonna to tolerate it. They are, you are unlikely to see, this is the battle plan. This is what we are going to do. Because in telling you, you're telling Russia and Belarus, what you need to listen for and look for are the key words in the statements. It is, and I am also reading between the lines. I think NATO will be clear to send a message that there will be no tolerance of further attacks. Deterrence is more important than war. So deterring the enemy, so they think it's not worth the risk, is important. So the words ahead of a perceived attack are the most important words. So listen to those words because those words are important. So that's Ukraine at the moment. Did I face discrimination from men? Yes, of course I did. You know, the awful thing about women going into any workplace is where there are 10 jobs, there are 20 men who wanted it and now there might be 20 women. That reduces the chance. Of course, people resent new entrants. In the same way as when you have um, jealousies about other nationalities coming into your workforce or coming into your workplace, there is always a desire to limit the competition when there are only a small number of opportunities. And in the United Kingdom, we have only just, only just managed to get 
a significant number of women in the House of Commons. And that only started with the first Blair government in 1997. 1997. And you know what, in 1997, they didn't have any toilets for women. In the mother of parliaments, there were no facilities. The shock to that building, horrific. There were sexualized behaviors and gestures that had to be called out. Things that I have to tell you, I'm sorry girls, but you've got no idea how bad it used to be because your generation has made a stand and generations before you have made a stand to say, we're not having that, that's not gonna happen. It's now about, and we have to fight every day for a society that says, you're the best person for the job, not the best sex for the job. And if, ever there was an area where that needs to be clearly said and illustrated, it's in the military. And we're having a little bit of a discussion about that in the UK at the moment. And I have to say, some of the most generous colleagues that I've ever worked with have been the men in Parliament who, when I, I walked into the chamber of the House of Commons and I was looking for someone and I, I went into the chamber and there were about six or seven people on the Conservative benches and about four people on the Labour benches talking about defence. Hang on a sec, there's no women here. Uh, and I was determined women were going to be in that room. And I would turn up to meetings and I would be the only woman in the meeting. But just entering the room changed the conversation. So you always have to change the conversation. And reaching to be the first woman president of the NATO parliament was really, really, really important for me. Sorry. So uh, we have many hands. Uh, so right. let's start from uh, on my uh, Victoria Sherba, then uh, Anna Fasse, Kirillo Dogopol. So please go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to express that it is a huge honor for us to have you today. Uh, and I've got two questions. So the first one is uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you stated, People have to take the responsibility for the power they have. And in your personal view, what is the main power of the young Ukrainian uh, generation? Is it a strong desire to change our country or the fact that we are still not complacent with the way we live, which acts as a driving factor? And uh, the second question is, do you think that cultural diplomacy is an important factor in building bridges between societies and enhancing mutually beneficial cooperation? Okay. I'm gonna go on the cultural diplomacy first. Yes, because as I said to you at the beginning, I first encountered NATO through culture, through the person who embodied that culture. And it left me with a lasting, my ear became attuned to Ukraine. Ah, yes, Ukraine. So I wanted to know more. So that's what cultural diplomacy does. Instead of you being just different or odd or unusual or threatening, you become, ah, right, okay, I get that. And none of us has the total perspective on anything. And Ukraine has much to teach as well as to learn. And Britain has much to teach as well as learn. So cultural diplomacy is a non-threatening and engaging way of doing that. The power that you have. Look, I stand 
on the shoulders of my mother, who makes me the woman I am. My grandmother, oh my goodness, my grandmother, you know, amazing woman, came from huge poverty. Her mother, who I never met, fleeing starvation in Ireland and making a life in a new country, battling prejudice against the Irish and building a dramatic future. We all stand on other people's shoulders. What you have is a power of understanding some of the changes that are confusing. older generations. I came to computers. I had, we had our first computer in our home about 1987, when my son was a, a little child. And we bought the computer, uh, Largely because we thought this, this is a future David needs to know about. So your power is around what have you learned from past generations? How do you take it forward? And what is there that you have learned that you're uncomfortable with? When my son, and he'll curse me you know, for telling you this, but when he was a child and he didn't like something, he'd say, I don't think it's fair, as you do when you're a child. And I would say, mm, it possibly isn't fair, but it's the rules as they are now. If you don't like them, do it differently when you grow up. And now he is a father. And I am so looking forward to his daughter telling him he's got it wrong. Oh boy! And I tell you what, I'll be helping her to say it. Because that's the role of children, to challenge their parents. To think differently. And to at the same time think, I'm not going to do it that way. I want it a different way. Okay. Thank you, Another Marilyn, question. because I think the role of our participants or students to challenge Ukrainian government, parliament, to think differently and uh, to speed up the process with Euro-Atlantic reforms. So actually, this is why we do believe that during our session, um, our distinguished participants, after all lectures, they will ask tough questions to the speaker of the Good. parliament. So we hope that they will challenge. Okay, just for gender balance, Kirill, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Madeline. Uh, it's really great opportunity to speak with you. A little bit horrible, <laughs> horrible not, uh, but it's I'm a little bit frightened. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> It's a joke. Uh, I want to ask you two questions. First of all, some countries don't want to learn um, lessons from other war, uh, like, uh, for example, France, um, uh, Turkey, um, for example, Hungary and Germany, especially. They have business with Russia, it's true. And in your opinion, what, uh, what uh, can happen to accept Russia like enemy, not a, like a business partner? for them. And second one, like a philosophy. What can be better than democracy? Well, I don't, I don't think there is anything better than democracy. We haven't found a perfect one yet. And there are times when democracies are severely under threat by the people who gain power. So democracy is only as good as the people in power and the challenges 
that citizens make to say, we're not having that. That's not good enough. We don't want it. Try harder. You know, we had, um, we had a situation recently where the government decided, uh, a member of the government's party um, had broken parliamentary rules. And his punishment was to be suspended from parliament for 30 days. And the government didn't want that. They wanted to protect him. So they decided, okay, we're gonna change all the rules. But they have a big majority, so they were able to push it through, despite some of their own members saying no. But the next day, wow, the public erupted and said, that stinks, we're not having that. And the very next day, the government backed down. They just won the vote. They had the right to do what they wanted, but the public said, no way. So it is, the public is powerful, but it is slow to wake up. So democracy is only as good as the participation of its people and the challenges to government to do better. There are many things that are said in parliament. So everyone will say the first rule of government is to protect its citizens. Yeah, it's not what they really think. What they really think is the first rule of government is to convince the citizens that they're getting a better life, that the economy is doing well, that there are jobs, that they can afford a holiday, that they can afford a new piece of furniture for the house. They can afford to go shopping and have new clothes. So the economy. And sometimes countries know the decisions they are making are not right, but it's good for the economy. So that's one. Two. Geography counts for everything. Look at who your powerful neighbors are and it will give you a very clear picture of the difficulties, the problems, the opportunities that you will have, even in this interconnected world. Now, I live in Wales. And I have a very, very difficult, threatening neighbour next door. It's called England. They drive us crazy. Now, and in Wales, we have lots of jokes about the English. To the extent that sometimes you see posters that say, don't take your litter home, throw it away in England. I expect it'll take a while for you to understand that one. But your neighbour and your neighbourhood is a very difficult one. And sometimes people are trying to make accommodations with difficult neighbours in the hope of keeping the peace or in the hope of building the economy. People don't always make the right judgments, they make the one that they think will keep them going until the next election, or the one that will let them gain more than if they made another decision. And that's the problem. And if you add into that history, so you mentioned Turkey, I'm reading a book at the moment uh, about the Balkans. It's blown my mind. So you have to understand geography, history, religion. All of these things come around the decisions that are made. Not always what is right. 
Hope that helps. Am I going to get a question from Cabo? Because I've got this hideous picture of Cabo here um, on the screen, and I want to know if he really looks like that. He's got no, his I'm hand not. up. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Anna Fesek, yes, please. Next, or yeah, you should ask the question, please. Uh, we are thankful to you for your inspiring speech, and I have two questions. The first one in the introduction uh, of the NATO um, 2030 initiative was mentioned about uh, valuable input um, from an independent uh, group of experts, civil society, young people, parliamentarians, and uh, private sectors to shape this initiative. Or uh, maybe tell us in what way yeah, the Secret General receives uh, these proposals and works on them. And further, member states discuss all of these ideas. And so the second question is about you have been working so many years helping um, youth. Share, uh, share with us experience um, of meeting these people and their gratitude to you for um, unstable desire uh, to help and support them? Oh. Well, I don't know that there's always uh, gratitude for trying to help people because sometimes you have to say to people, no, this is not gonna work. You can't have what you want. Sometimes you have to say no in politics. As a, as a politician, the worst problem is when someone arrives at your, at your door and they have a suitcase full of papers and they feel a wrong was done to them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they want you to put it right. And sometimes you just have to say, it's too late. You've got to let go. You can't put that right. And people don't like that. People don't like being told, no, it's not possible. So you don't always get gratitude. If you get gratitude, I wouldn't have lost my seat. I wouldn't have been sacked as a member of parliament. <laughs> so you can only always offer to do your best. And it's up to people whether that's good enough. And to be honest, on the door when I was campaigning, people would say, hey, we like you. We just don't trust your leader. We don't trust the leader of your party. So we can't vote for you because we might get the leader of your party. So gratitude doesn't come into politics. Gratitude doesn't come into many jobs. Ask somebody who works in the health service right now. You know, people are not grateful, even though the health service has kept us all alive. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost track of the first part of the question. Could you simplify it for me again? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, according to the introduction of um, the NATO 2030 initiative, uh, one um, effect was mentioned about um, valuable input uh, from um, groups of experts, civil society, using NATO agenda. Could you tell us more about this process, how General Secretary receives <laughs> these facts? Okay, right. So. One of the things that uh, one of the things when you you know you need to move forward and you need to change is to get an independent group of experts. So lots of people came together to try and filter all of the ideas that were coming from uh, academia, military, civil society, and to bring it down to this is the importance of the way forward. <sighs> One of the hardest things in life is when you've got 500 great ideas to decide which of 
the great ideas you're going to have to throw out on which you can move forward because you can make those happen and make them happen soon. It is important that people engage with the process. So if you're offered an opportunity to put your views forward, always take it. That's one. Don't always assume it will be taken up. Not because it's a bad idea, not because it can't be done. It's just you can only offer so much change at one time. Human beings say they thrive on change. They don't. They really, really don't. They don't like change. And if you ever want to understand change, if you're right-handed, from tomorrow, write with your left hand and see how quickly you'll go back to using your right. Change is painful, it's slow, it's uncomfortable. So often when you ask experts from civil society, um, independent experts, academics, business people, it's about filtering down to what changes can you realistically take forward and that can be absorbed by the organization. And you will, you will find that because change is coming at you fast all the time because you are at the age where change is happening to you as a person, your personality is evolving and growing. Your experience in life is evolving and growing. Your body is evolving and growing. Your relationships are. And sometimes it gets too much and you, you want to retreat from it. And that's what happens to organizations and societies. They can only absorb so much change. So change is not always as fast as we'd like it to be. And that's because we don't like change being fast. We lie to ourselves. So, I hope that helps. So, yes, we have uh, six uh, raised hands and plus oh. 20 minutes left. So please, uh, Irina. Shorter. Batu, yes, shorter, yeah, please. Yeah. Irina, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks a lot uh, for your speech. Uh, my question is: um, Is there something that motivates you and helps you achieve so much? Uh, you only get one crack at it. Basically, you only get one chance. So either do it well, or don't do it. The chance to sit in the House of Commons. I'm number 264. I'm the 264th woman ever to be an MP in the history of Britain. 264. You don't let a chance like that go. It is important. And you too will be a part of the change in the world. So when you get your opportunity, you put your body and soul, and sometimes I'm afraid you neglect your family and you neglect your friends, and there is a price to be paid. But motivation, you're never gonna get a chance like this. Like today, when else am I gonna get a chance? to talk to you and try and get you energized for the future. <laughs> Who knows, maybe in five, 10 years, one of our students <laughs> will become a deputy minister, a minister, and some of your messages <laughs> will be tested. Yeah. yeah. And Charles, my job Daria. will be done. Yeah, Daria yeah. Panova, please. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, we are really thankful for you, for your speech. And my question, uh, I want to start with that uh, saying that dem 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 
sorry, democratic crisis uh, that now exists in Europe is having a strong impact even on uh, um, the most strong democracies uh, even in the world, and uh, it's a big new threat. And what uh, impact do you think it um, has and will have uh, in the future on NATO and work of the alliance? And uh, uh, do you think such influence is partly provoked uh, by Russia and its uh, actions uh, in the um, international uh, arena. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So, I said we don't like change. And I've said we're a bit slow on the uptake. We're slow to learn lessons in the West. But actually, being pushed out of your complacency is good for you. So, yes, there is a crisis in democracy. Yes, Russia and China and North Korea and Iran have destabilized us. There's no doubt about it. But, oh dear, just wait till we get it back together because it's too important to not get it right. So we're not always the fastest, but we are unwilling to give up. And yes, this is a time of crisis, but a time of crisis is also a time of opportunity. And the opportunity is to grow. And none of us likes being forced to grow. We like to take it slowly. And you know, the good grief, the challenges to growth, the you experience every day at the age you are. You know what that's like. I'm facing a different set of challenges in my personal life. I cannot tell you how horrific it is not to be working. I cannot tell you how horrific it is to no longer have the face that I used to have. I got this old lady's face, like thinking, who the heck is that? Life is full of challenge. And we are at a time of crisis and challenge. But we'll get there. But you have to be part of that. Thank you, Madeline, for very much. Thank you. Yeah, but we still have a raised yes, hand. Go, go, go. The written question, one is from Sergei Kachenko. Uh, thank you uh, for your interesting lecture. As we know, a lot of people call London like London Grad due to a big number of rich Russians. Therefore, I have a question to you. How dangerous for Britain and its sovereignty is Russian corruption and their money? So it's about oligarchy, strategic corruption, dirty money, not just from Russia, I would add China, Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine, also Ukrainian oligarchs, they like London and their children like uh, uh, yep. Oxford. And uh, so important question also. Yeah, it's highly dangerous. And the fact that the government has refused to respond to the House of Commons report on the threat from Russia and the involvement of Russia in Brexit their refusal to answer that report from our Intelligence and Security Committee, deeply worrying. Uh, their refusal to enact legislation about uh, money laundering in London, or in the UK, uh, strategic ownership of critical national infrastructure and critical defence and national companies, these are major threats and we unfortunately have at the moment a government that has done very well politically out of Russian money 
and many Russians have joined the Conservative Party. They've got British citizenship and joined the Conservative Party. So yeah, it's a big threat and we're very aware of it. Thanks a lot. So now Mikhailo Perevoznik, Alice from Wonderland and Maria Boko. So three last uh, students asking questions. So please, Mikhailo. Okay. Thank you. My question is, will online safety bill, which has now been discussed in British Parliament, be a threat to human rights? And can it become a precedent for other Western countries to implement similar laws? The, sorry, the what safety bill? Online safety bill, which has now been discussed oh, the in online. British Parliament. Okay, okay. okay. Well, I expect it's rubbish. Legislation that comes into the House of Commons is always rubbish. So you know what a sausage machine is like, yeah? You put food in here, it goes down, and what comes at the other end is nothing like what goes in at the beginning. All legislation that goes into the House of Commons tends to be rubbish. It's what happens to it when it's debated on the floor, when it goes into committee, and when we argue line by line, word by word, that it changes. And then it goes down to the Lords and they do it again. That's the real power and purpose of Parliament, is to change rubbish legislation and improve it and make it stronger. I expect it won't be good enough because the Googles of this world, the Facebooks of this world, they have too much power and too much influence. But that's where you are important to helping because you see it on a daily basis. Okay. Okay, Maria and Alice, please. Oh, maybe I can start. Um, thank you for even more than just powerful action. And uh, I have a question. Uh, there is a hypothesis that Ukraine should be a bridge between Europe and Russia, a bit naive and a completely peaceful metaphor, but I understand it contains a number of negative cliches. A bridge is something that is made for others to use, and we have full-fledged political actors on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, it is a dumb subject for the convenience of others. Not to mention that when they say the Ukraine is like a bridge between Europe and Russia. Ukraine is excluded from Europe, despite the fact that there is no a single centimeter of Ukrainian territory under Ukrainian jurisdiction outside Europe. So what do you think? What motivates, motivates uh, such a cliche? And how widespread is it among the community in the United Kingdom? Mm. Okay. I quite like the bridge analogy. And you know what the first thing you do when you go to war? Do you know what you do? You blow your bridges. <laughs> you blow up the bridges because it slows the enemy down. And you know how to get around the bridge not being there. Your enemy doesn't. So is Ukraine a bridge? Well, you have history, so that's always going to be there. But I don't think bridges are just for other people to use. That bridge is there for you to make the journey from being part of Russia to being part of Europe. So use the bridge for the purpose you want it used for, not the purpose that other people tell you it's for and then it's your bridge not anybody else's bridge okay i know there's one more question and we're running out of time thank you Ma maria bokova is our last student with radio please uh, good evening uh, I want to thank you for the interesting lecture. It is a great honor to speak to you today. And I have got uh, two questions. Uh, so in view of the existing threats such as COVID-19, uh, Chinese growing role, uh, do you think that NATO and European Union uh, will be able to maintain its leadership in the near future? And uh, do you think the word, what, the word was free is possible? 
Okay. Uh, can NATO EU keep its leadership? Yeah. Because there is a will. There is a determination. And ultimately, our societies are actually stronger. Because we want to keep the quality of life we have. Russians are used to suffering terrible privation. And I sometimes wonder why it is they like London so much when they've got so much money. Why aren't they enjoying their own country? It's because of what they aspire to. So the wealthy Russians aspire to something they deprive their own citizens from. No country can be strong when it operates like that. Do I think there'll be a World War Three? I think climate change is a bigger threat than World War Three right now. I think that World War Three, if it comes, will come from climate change. It's going to be about the instability created by people moving from areas of the world that are no longer going to be habitable. From areas of the world where there are no water supplies or too much water. Areas of the world where there is no food. Areas of the world that is too hot to sustain life. And it is in defense against that vast movement of people that I think the real threat of World War III probably lies. So the biggest defense challenge in some respects, and I'm so disappointed in the leaderships of particularly China and India, that they can't recognize those threats because both have got vast populations all of their country will have problems both countries will have problems with water rising temperatures areas that are no longer going to be fertile for the growing of crops and to feed themselves and at some point the world has to wake up to that threat sorry your problem. Sorry. Sorry, Ray. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're going to have to sort out. Yeah, I think it's about sustainable development and also our responsibility. Today's generations before the future. So, and uh, let me um, uh, finish our lecture today with wonderful quote. The chief problem in Europe today is the Ukrainian problem of deep concern to this country because of its effect upon European peace and diplomacy. It's at the same time closely bound with British interest of a very vital nature. So uh, this quote belongs to uh, Lancelot Lawton and he wrote his famous um, report, the Ukrainian question in 1935. And actually, he presented it in the House of Commons in May 29, in 1935. So uh, this is what Madeline mentioned, that uh, Ukraine is now is even more uh, popular than Afghanistan and many others. But I think there is a big uh, connection between uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, UK and uh, the UK ambassador Melinda Simons just two days ago made a tweet on her uh, Twitter stopped uh, by to see Agata of Kiev, wife of Edward the Exiled Prince. Their grandchild Matilda married King Henry uh, uh, I of England. History of UK and Ukraine goes back a very, very long way. 
So, uh, and in cell, so there is sent a very beautiful, you mentioned that Kiev is a stunning uh, city capital. So we have beautiful St. Sophia Cathedral, <laughs> which was built at the beginning of 11th century when Moscow didn't exist. And our <laughs> roots, <laughs> Ukraine and UK. So it's like your ambassador uh, tweeted just a few days ago. So I think for the future, it's really important to have such uh, connections, such bridges like we had now, virtual bridges from yeah, UK to fun. Ukraine. So it's awesome uh, lecture. And uh, Madeline, you are very like passion uh, uh, person, really. And then you still have a lot of spirit. And I think uh, you have to try again, run into parliament after this break, so such refreshment and um, share experience. We do hope to see you next spring during the NATO, the historic NATO parliamentary assembly as the first women president of NATO PA. So I think it's, it's, I think it's, it's really important. So students, I think uh, we have to uh, say yeah. thank you. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, dear Madeline. Yeah, because uh, you contributed a lot to strengthen the uh, Euro Atlantic identity of our participants and us. And uh, we belong to the optimists. And one day we hope Ukrainian flag will be among the um, flags NATO. of members of NATO. So students, uh, now you see how wonderful uh, British MPs uh, are and <laughs> friends of Ukraine and uh, really a very Big impressive friend. and a lot of yeah a lot of um, uh, so, uh, so, so, a lot of food for uh, thoughts or thoughts for food or so, for thinking. <laughs> yes, so I, I think it's really um, important and I agree with you when you said that uh, uh, no tolerance for uh, further attacks. Today, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kuleba, had meeting with uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO mm -hmm. Secretary General, Good. and uh, it's great that they had this meeting, exchange of uh, information, and I agree that it's a time for no tolerance right. for further attacks from uh, Russia or other countries like Belarus, mm -hmm. uh, other dictators. So students, uh, in 30 minutes, uh, you have now a break for 30 minutes, and then we will have one of the key experts in energy security, Mikhailo Honchar, because uh, Putin is blackmailing not just Ukraine, but also the EU with gas price and uh, also, so it's a part of hybrid threats. So this is why please be ready also to ask uh, good questions in 30 minutes and other experts. And Madeline, thanks again. Thank you. I See you it. next year you in person in Kiev. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.